So get your paints out, your easel, and start getting out into that wilderness and painting. Uh, Victoria Chick is back on Big Blend Radio today, and she's going to talk about the beginnings of plain air history. How did it get started that someone's going to sit and paint out in the field, out in nature, or a wildflower, you know, meadow, who knows? Um, now, based in Silver City in southwest New Mexico, Victoria is a contemporary figurative artist and also an early 19th, 20th century print collector. And you can view her work if you go to her website, victoriachick.com, and also read her articles and listen to her past interviews. Go to blendradioandtv.com or nationalparktraveling.com. She's in both of our magazines and on both websites. Just type in Victoria, and you'll find her. So on that note... Hi, Victoria. We found you. How are you? <laughs> Hello. Hello, Lisa. Hey, this is hey. a good day for being outside and doing painting, too. It is such a nice day today. Well, we have oh. nothing but clouds. In yeah. fact, we went for our early morning walk and couldn't see anything, and we realized, you know, we're in the desert. Do you think we should have flashlights? <laughs> I'm just saying. So you don't have the big overcast thing we've had the last couple of days. Well, here. I expect it's going to be coming. Yeah, it's probably headed our way right now. We we like so, to trade off but, weather. But the so send us some great. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> so the, do you do you ever go out and paint outside? I mean, you've got such a nice studio, the Caltrail Art Studio, and it is on a Caltrail. Um, <laughs> but you get <laughs> Well, <out>. Lisa. <laughs> no, I love plein air painting, but I don't do it myself. I have tried it, but I tend to to like to paint large and the wind is my enemy. So uh, so plain air doesn't work for me. And I also use acrylic, which uh, plain air painters tend not to use. They use oil paint instead because, it, you know, the drying rate is just too fast with acrylic and it's hard to manipulate it, in, mm-hmm. you know, as quickly as you need to do to, to do a, a really good plain air painting. Oh. It, I think a lot of them that I've seen use watercolors, and that's really odd because that really dries fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Um I actually, I haven't, I, I think it depends on where you live. Because here in the Southwest, mm. it might be different. I've never, actually never seen anybody use watercolors, except maybe as a quick sketch or something. Yeah, but, maybe, um, yeah, because they're small paintings, not big. Yeah, and and right. the wind is, the wind is really, <laughs> it's not even the wind, a slight breeze. It, that's and, all it takes, yeah, you're right, yeah. you're right. Yeah, but the best, but though, oil, I mean, paint, oil paint seems to be the the preferred the preferred paint, and mm-hmm. um, people who do it um, and and you know work quickly. I think that's one of the keys to successful plein air painting. Just put mm-hmm. the paint down. Um, you may want to think about it before you you put your stroke down, but don't mess with it too much after afterwards, because you like that freshness that plein air gives. Mm. I've I've tried it and I gave up pretty quick. I have to be honest. <laughs> yeah. And I did I did the oils and then I discovered this was when I was on our tour for uh, in South Africa, and I realized I hadn't made plans as to how you're going to transport wet oil paintings. Uh, and yes. yeah, so that was our first obstacle. The second one, okay, I changed to acrylics, and I actually had the experience of mid brush stroke as I'm thinking. The paint dried and the brush stuck to the painting. I'm like, okay. And then the third trial, some um, Maasai warriors came up and told me I was painting the mountain in the wrong place. And (laughs) and then there were bugs all stuck in it. And I'm like, okay, I like my studio. (laughs) Yeah. Mm. (laughs) There's there's always a lot less interference in the studio. But people, because people do like to gather around somebody when they see them painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some people can handle that. So other other people are you know are tend to be a little more, more private. Uh mm. and it makes them makes them uh, maybe more inhibited than they ought to be. But um to each his own I guess. Mm. You know it's interesting we just interviewed an artist um and she's back in, in well she lives up in Wynola near Julian in Ramona area. Oh, yeah. You, you know uh-huh. that Ramona area really well, and that's how we met you. I do. When, when, I, in that region. I even know Wynola. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, you know, they make granola in Wynola. I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> it's Friday. If they, um, if they don't, they should. Uh, yeah, her name's Coco Brown, and she's in the Parks and Travel magazine, the December issue that came out um, now. And uh, okay. she's right out after your Totem article. And so we were talking with her, and she was saying that she got into plein air painting. And she started with soft pastels, and now she paints, does oil and everything. But 
she does not only does plain air painting, she goes out at night and does plain air painting. Now, have you yeah. heard of anybody doing that? I don't know if that's just because she lives no, in Julian no, and things I, like I that think could she, happen. She, she may be unique in, in doing that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, and they, may, they must be interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at, like, you're going to see raccoons up in the fig trees or <laughs> the apple trees. I think you, when you look at your painting the next day in the daylight, you're either going to go, wow, that's cool, or uh-oh. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Well, you've got a great article, Victoria, about plain air painting will, and its origins. I will take a look at that, yes. I, oh, yeah, I will, I will send you the link and, so you can see her. But everyone, uh, she'll be on the show, too, soon. Um, you'll be able to hear her interview uh, December 10th, I'm, I believe, off the top of my head. But um, what's interesting, too, um, you know, your article and everyone, this will be up on nationalparktraveling.com next week and in our, our February Parks and Travel magazine. Um, you talk about like a true plain air artist, like you are going to finish the painting out in the field. Like you don't just do like here I'm sketching, you know, painting this, you know, beautiful ocean mm. sunrise, you know, sunrise <laughs> over the ocean. You have to stay there and finish it. You do not go home. Well, <laughs> it, 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 to be a true plain air painter, yeah, you do. And and there are wow. um, there are probably uh, more than was probably one more more than one way of working. Uh, by painters who call themselves plein air painters, but if you're going to be a purist, you have to stick it stick it out to the bitter end, <laughs> and not take wow. it back to your studio to finish it. Yeah. So, um, and then and a lot of painters, you know, um, well, there's there's some hostility hostility <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> among painters who are purists or uh, with with painters who you know they don't respect painters as much who do it back in their studio, finish it off back in their studio. Oh, come on, so. guys. Be nice. <laughs> yeah. Let's play nice yeah. together. Yeah. You know, it's, it's painting, you guys. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and the, the end result is what counts. But there is, I think, plein air pain, painting, while it, it's got obstacles, it is fun. But it also, if you tend to overpaint or overthink your painting, mm -hmm. it yeah. cures you. It yeah. does, it does, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, I, I I I love to I love to look at plein air painting. I really really do. Uh, and there's some excellent plein air painters back in that Ramona Julian area. Mhm. Mm um, yeah, you know, you get the seasons. I think that you're out there, and and would you consider okay? So if someone's a plain, if it is it just strictly you're painting outside, and it's scenery landscapes, or like what happens if you like you know, we're at the beach, I'm at the beach for some reason today, and you paint, like, kids playing on the beach or something like that, would that now? Well, it's, it, all that is okay. It's not so much subject matter. It's, it's, it's being outside, yes. Uh, you could, people have figures in them. People, uh, people paint city, city scenes in, uh, in, in plein air. Um, it's more of a, an attitude and approach that you keep it fresh. You don't do a lot of picky detail and um yeah you mm -hmm. you, you know you you you, if you want you want the picture to to create an impression that there's there's air movement i don't know if that that sounds clear enough but everything's fresh everything's um it's kind of sparkly it's it's indistinct yeah. if you like if you're looking at something in the distance for instance you don't see it in great detail so um uh, a lot of the plein air work tends to be somewhat simplified uh, with mm. just, you know, um, very very basic brush strokes, broad brush strokes. It, you know, and I think when the, the plein air painters, um, they went through kind of phases. I mean, you know, was, I remember meeting an artist in South Africa who did uh, pastel portraits of people in a bar. and mm -hmm. uh, Rob Waring. Yeah, Rob Waring. And he he it's like we used to have these, these, these like kind of contests almost about certain things. And then I'm like, why don't you do it outside? Go on, do it outside. And he's like, ah. Oh. And then he got up and he said, man, that was fun. And he started doing different kinds of pastels outside. And yep. and things were they were way sparklier. 
Mm. Yes. But he, then yes. he's like, now i got to change my kind of paper, and this can work. And this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was really fun. And I was yeah. struggling to paint indoors in the hotel because of the lighting. Mm. I, I was mm-hmm. having a really hard time. I, I, every time I took something home, it looked totally different to me. I'm like, no, I want to go. No. <laughs> so I, and I think you, you start as a plein air painting, you might be considering color, in a different way, and then you get all confused with the lighting because it keeps moving on you. Yeah, I you know plain plain air painting today uh, is diff- way different than it was when it started. Because when it when it started, it, the paint they, well the number the types of, of paint you were you're using um, were different. The colors mm-hmm. were different. You were generally using um, earth tones. And it wasn't until the impressionists came along that, that brighter colors started being used. And now you see a, a real mix of old of, of approaches in, in color harmony and um, and just the, their, the palettes. There's a bigger range of palette choices than there used to be 150 or 60 years ago. Yeah, mm. that's true. You don't have to mix as many things yourself. <laughs> Well, you know that's that's the thing that set that set plein air painting off. Really, uh, was the invention of paints of the tubes that they would put paints in, and you know, the industrial revolution changed all all the uh, approaches to learning how to paint. Because it used to be that everybody had to mix their own paints, and they had a mortar and the pestle, and they'd get the minerals and they'd put the oil in it and and all whatever uh, mediums that they would uh, use to to mix the paint, and then they, sometimes they would hire uh, assistants. Well, they actually wouldn't hire them. They would they would be apprentices, and so mm-hmm. the apprentice got, who went to learn how to paint got to, got to do all the grudge work of mixing paints first, and oh, wow. that lasted, I mean, that was the way it was until the mid-19th century when, when, like when the Industrial Revolution happened, and, can... and they started putting in, in paint. Paint and trees. That's like, so that's like you can't. That's like telling somebody, "I'm sorry, before you can make a salad, you have to go grow your own garden." <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you have to appreciate your veggies. And, I'd yeah. be, I'd be going. No, we're doing charcoal, yeah. or I'm, pa- I'm finger painting with red wine. <laughs> that's how it's gonna work for me. Oh. But wow. So, so actually, getting the oil—that's a whole thing, and then. It, it's interesting you talk about the industrial revolution too, because I mean that also, you know, going back to national parks and how they were created with Thomas Moran and and people like that, who's mm-hmm. the artists we've talked about with you educating us on that, which was awesome. Um, it was part of that too, railroads and things like that, that made it possible for them to get to these natural places. And then even cart their giant paintings around, and you know, to, to well, be able to. Yeah, of course, those guys weren't plein air painters. You know, they no. they would do sketching and and maybe you know they might have done little watercolors to to mm-hmm. uh, remember the color in their have some mm-hmm. reference besides their brain to remember that because they would go back then to the East Coast and they would do those huge paintings in their studios, and um, yeah, they're 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 so wonderful. Um, mm. A lot of times the sketches but, are nicer you, than the final painting just because yeah. of the freedom of it. Yeah, but I mean, right. but having to get to the wilderness areas, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, yes, if you think about Right, and, and the railroads had a big part in that. And of course, when, it, when this type of painting started, uh, it was really radical. Uh, people, people were kind of shocked at it. Not only the really avant garde artists did it, and they, they, those were the people in Paris. Primarily, who lived in Paris, and they—that was when the train railroad started up in France, and you know, even before 1800, 1850, excuse me. And they had a they had a line, a railroad line that went from Paris out into a forest about 30 miles away, called Forest of Fontainebleau, and that was a, a kind of an art colony area, and a lot of painters. Um, live there or would go out there on the weekend because the train made it easy. Hmm. It was, you know, 30 miles on a train. It doesn't take very long. So um, they would go out for the day and get back at home at night. 
and so they would paint out there. So, yeah, because wasn't Fontainebleau, those, those painters, weren't they pretty much like the beginning of painting nature and landscapes and oh, things yes. like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there were there were there was a group. Called, they were the French realists. They called, they considered themselves to be realists. Mm. Um, wow. In fact, I think they were <laughs> one of the old, few few groups of painters that actually named themselves <laughs> rather than having an art critic name them. But they they felt Ooh. they were being true to nature. And, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. So would would you put like. The botany, I know those are illustrations, but would you put that kind of art, like, you know, how people did the paintings of the birds, like Swainson's and, you know, J- John Audubon, and would you put them um, in that criteria or no? Well, just on the realism uh, side. Let me see. No, not exactly, because they were, mm-hmm. their their reason for painting was different. Yeah. You know, they okay. were, they were, they're more like science, scientific yeah. painting. Um, it, although they were trying to be as realistic as they could, mm. but the but the realists, um, in like addition Nancy's to art. well, the other thing really. that the other thing that distinguished the realists was besides the, uh, was oh, I'm going to get mixed up here <laughs> and try to put too much in, but um, be, prior to that time, painters did worked in their studios. They they did paintings that were allegorical, or they did paintings that were religious, or they did portraits. Um, mm-hmm. That and that and that was and this was considered lofty subject matter. So the the realists, in addition to to painting, starting to paint outside, they were painting subject matter that was a common man. And so mm-hmm. you know, if there were people picking potatoes or doing road work or uh, raking their yard or something, that was subject matter for the realists. Hmm. And they didn't. Yeah. They felt that um, what they were. And the interesting thing at the time was they were doing it for themselves because there was not a market for this kind of painting at the time. Okay. You know, outdoor painting. Who wants that? You know. <laughs> now everybody, people love the outdoors. They love paintings of nature and the landscape. Mm-hmm. But prior to that time, landscape was always sort of a afterthought or a background to what the real subject was. Well, how did they survive? Well, I think that's exactly how, <laughs> this is, you know. This is I where mean, the term because, starving artist comes from. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it is, because before, I think painters, um, you had to do the they p- were portrait. commissioned to do a portrait or commissioned to do a certain kind of painting Paint for the a, you know, a purpose. And so they had all those restrictions and then the, all the religious paintings and things. And then you come across now that things change up and people are painting like, you know, okay, let's let's paint railroad workers, woohoo, you know, and yeah. and then who who is going to put that on their wall? Because, A lot of people yeah. actually. Well, no, today, but yeah. back then, if if you weren't one of the railroad <laughs> workers, you weren't that nobody would mm. buy it. Mm. And right. then money comes the market into just, the market. Just was not there, and it and it was probably another fifty years before that that subject matter became acceptable to to the majority of people who were who were in the, who were able to buy paintings. Because mm-hmm. you got to remember that the the middle class wasn't very big, the mm. and the poor class was even Bigger. small. It was much larger. And yeah. the people who had the money to buy paintings were probably they probably wanted something what what they would have considered elegant subject matter mm-hmm. in their in their place they were going to put the painting rather than some guy you know grubbing around in the dirt. <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 you know the markets the markets changed and 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 economics change and we 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 tend to think of things. Um, from an art standpoint, as they are today, we have, and we forget, you know, what it was mm. like at different times in the in the, in the world. Yeah, mm. and it's different true places because, in the world. I mean, even the size of paintings and the colors used mm-hmm. have, right. have changed. You know, according to what you can get, and and you know, it's it's. You also talk about that too, where the artists um, kind of changed as you know as as you know plainer painting started to grow as as you know a, a way to do this that the colors changed and and the lighting and things like that changed you know from when you look at going back to Fontainebleau in the 1850s 
with is it Karat? Am I getting his name correct or Caro? How do you Corot. pronounce that? Corot. I knew I wouldn't be right on the first one. You know? <laughs> well, I, I think French, feel like... French is French is Go difficult. Ahead. So it is no, it's just an OT. It's not always the same every single time. So I, yeah. So anyway, Corot, he was he was a leader of this this whole thing. He was like the plein air yeah. dude. Okay. Yes, yeah, so he was. He, he was really. Deep. He was really the first person that really started painting this way, and other people followed him then. Hmm. And, and the paintings, the paint that they were using, um, was a lot of it was new because of because of uh, chemistry. And chemistry was a new subject matter then, a new new area mm-hmm. of study. Um, and there was all these manufacturing things going on, and we had all these things called cool tar. Maybe you've heard mm-hmm. of that. And they were they would they would experiment and they would just decide that they could make a color out of this using this oh. as a basis. Well, it was really more suitable as a dye. And a lot of these um, paints that were coal tar derivatives. There's there's one called Prussian blue, which is actually also yeah. medicine. Um, but wow. It's a it's a nice nice dark blue, but yeah, um, it, it oxidizes over time. So a lot of the paintings that you look at today that were done in France back in the last part of the 19th century have gotten very dark. They mm. were not this dark when they were painted. So it gives us a, a a false impression, I think, of what the artist was look was trying to do at the time. Hmm. hmm. How interesting! It, yeah, and and I, I like even the term realist in art. You know, it's like we are not fake news. We're not fake art. Well, think, you know, I think that <laughs> <That's>, the introduction <laughs> of photography changed the art world. Yeah, a lot. Right, and then it merged, and then yeah. it merged, and yeah, and I think I, you know, I think that's maybe why, um, you know, the rich person that wanted the portrait and then could have a photograph. Mm. Which was probably financially out of the reach of, of most of the other people um, right. would want the newest thing on the market. You know how that works. So, mm. you know, maybe. Well, you know, you mentioned photography, and that is another interesting little thing about plein air painting is plein air painting never, never, nobody, it never stopped being done. But one of one of the things it was it was going on coincidentally with the beginning of photography. And so here are these painters out there trying to do what they can they can would call realism. Yeah. And then you have the photographers, and the photographers really had an edge over yeah. the painters in some respects because they could they could do you know, an actual picture. Hmm. Um, yep. Then the then I think that was one of the reasons that you see there are a lot of changes coming about in art, beginning with the French Impressionists whose palette was totally different, <coughs> excuse me, um, and they were using complementary colors in, in, in small areas and trying to trying to um, push the limits of light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that's what they were painting, which really was the, 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 how light reflects off surfaces. So, yeah. and, and a um, camera at the time, couldn't deal with it in the same way. They were using light too, but not color. Mhm. And so yeah. people got and excited about impressionism. Sometimes it, sometimes sometimes violently excited because <laughs> they they thought it was too radical. But it didn't take very long before impressionism outstripped realism as mm. um a desirable kind of painting. Yeah. That's what I think is so neat is when these shifts happen it's kind of interesting, like, how we learn that we can have solar power and people get, you know, there's drama over it before people get onto it, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you're stealing from this, you know. It's like, oh, no, the photographers are coming as a plein air artist. But then <laughs> you, you, every, then the photographers learn something new and so does the other side, the artist. So, it, right. you know, things always develop. But there's always that, like, eh, <laughs> you know, oh, change is coming and – you know, when you're doing something, especially when you think of look at the timeline of this, mm-hmm. you know, it, it didn't take that long for artists to go into from realism into the impressionism side of it. And right. I think that and, back again. and because nature changes with every second, you know, faster than what we can see, what, what the human eye can see. 
And you're never going to – like a photo can capture that one second, but you go to take the next photo and it's gone. It's already changed. And a, a camera can do it quicker than an artist can out there. And so I think it's an interesting challenge of being able to go out there and paint and, you know, try to remember the lighting or are you going to change your lighting as you start. I mean, I mean that's the process of plein air painting has got to be – Really so you, interesting. You go out in the in the early morning and you start by painting the sunset as it's coming up and sunrise. The sunrise. Why I'm good on words today. I know. <laughs> and so <laughs> the, the sun is rising and you keep painting. So the sun keeps getting higher in the sky. So you keep changing your painting and then you keep going and you keep going and then you end up with a sunset painting because you could just keep <laughs> painting and painting what you see while you're out there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, it's it's interesting to me. That or you could just take a photo. <laughs> yeah, but but even that, even now, I mean, look at what photographers are doing. You know, just in how cameras have evolved, and learning how to read light. I mean, it's just changed so much since An- Ansel Adams. Like mm-hmm. he would always say, you know, if I get one good photo out of over a thousand or something or ten thousand, I can't remember yeah. the number. Like you know, you've done well. Even if it was only one good photo a year, he deemed that good. You know, now we're we're all going. Wait, we've got cell phones. We can photograph. Oh, please, you <laughs> right. just not photos. true. I know, but you know what I mean. It's it's right. so changed, and now photographers are battling the people who run around saying, "Look, my cell phones. You know, I'm I'm great." And and it's <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's technology changes things. I mean, changes the way we see, um, changes the mm. way we interpret things, changes the way we accept things. Um, it's you just it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing thing, and you don't know what's going to happen. In, in in ten years, something else will come along, um, and exactly. and make whatever yep. is techno- technologically cutting edge today seem pretty tame. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can paint a picture using your computer, and you know, and a tablet with a a pen or your finger now, if you really got that good a finger that. You mean your finger painting on a yeah, computer? Yeah, finger painting on your tablet and print it out, you know. Uh, yeah. It, there's a, there's all kind. Of, you can pick what kind of brush you want. You can pick the size of the brush. You can pick whether you want it to be a drier stroke or a wetter stroke and by the pressure you put on the tablet. Mm-hmm. But it's just not the same. I'm sorry. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, do, do you remember Mary Gravel, Victoria, in Silver City? Do you remember her? Yes. She's an artist. Yeah. She's up in Sedona area now. And she takes okay. people out on hikes who've never painted, and she teaches them oh, how to oh, paint nice. right there and then. Like, but it's you know they're not doing oils; they're doing something pretty quick. Like, I I don't know what sure. she's using because I don't know, but it's it's really neat to see people go out. It I think that those kinds of things about getting out there, even if you're not an artist, you're learning how to do something. I think it helps people look and be more observant. By going out, absolutely, yeah. That's the thing, yeah. yeah. Well, and and you know that as an artist, and also being a figurative <laughs> artist. So how does I know you don't do plain air painting? You've tried, but and you know you do paint like ginormous paintings. You yeah, really right. do. I, like that big horse painting, man. I love that painting. Um, when when you look at being a figurative artist. Doesn't that kind of tie into plain air because you're capturing that moment right there? So like what I was talking mm-hmm. about, the lighting and everything. And the movement. Wouldn't, I know it's a movement, but, I mean, if it's a deer that walks by, even a flower starts to rise its head up to the sun and open up its petals, you know? Yeah. So wouldn't that be figurative too? Well, uh, painting outside, yes, yes. Um, I think you, cause figurative doesn't depend on place, but... Mm-hmm. Um, other people who would consider themselves plein air painters, if I if I said I was doing a plein air painting <laughs> of a figure, they'd be they'd be really bummed at me. They wouldn't like that. They they would think I was um, mis misleading people, and and I and I think I would be. <laughs> but um, uh, but hmm. yes, it, I mean figurative just is you're painting you're painting things that are recognizable. You know, you're not you're not abstracting particularly. You're not um, hmm. you're not being. You don't necessarily have to be detailed, but you're just you're 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 
you're interested in the in the subject matter as an object. Hmm. I look and at it. And it, it, it may be that you're flattening the space. It may be that you're not using the you know colors that um, somebody there, no. would hmm. think would be natural. Hmm. Um, there's just you know, there's, there, I guess in all painting today, there's a lot of overlap um, of what people do because they're not held down by um, rigid guidelines, rigid rules. Yes. Exactly like in music right yeah. now. In music, you know, even our next guest coming on, they're like, are you country, are you rock? And he's like, do I have to choose sides? You know, yeah. it's like, can we yeah. get over it? You know, musicians now, I think, you know, there's some that are really strictly just pure blues and that's your blues, you know. But even that, now they're doing, like, rap inside blues. So, I, you know, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but musicians don't want to be pigeonholed anymore. And I wonder if, like, that's happening in the art world. It's like whatever I decide to do today is what I do. You know, I look at, like, Ted DeGrazia. Mm-hmm. He'll paint and he'll do all kinds of things. But he was into reproduction because he, he was a businessman, too. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's different as well. So the one thing I did want to ask before you go is, you know, so we talk about France and then, you know, railroads taking people out to Fontainebleau and, you know, they're getting out there in the countryside and uh, painting outside. How did it come over to America? Did did the Frenchmen come over and say, come on, Americans, you need to paint outside, get well, out there? <laughs> actually, actually, it was the reverse. I, there were a number of people on the East Coast that were, were painters. And, of course, in the, eight, in the early 1900s, the big thing to do if you wanted to become a real painter was you would go to France and you would you go to Paris specifically and you would study art and how to paint and blah blah blah. And so a lot of these, a lot of American artists went over there in the in the in the nineteenth century and they while they didn't go over to specifically to study that kind of painting, they were exposed to it. And they, they some of many of them really liked it and tried it and came back and they found that it was suitable. The type of painting that was being done in Fontainebleau was actually suitable for the aesthetic of the area, like of the East Coast, like New York, because the colors, um, the light was similar. And so mm-hmm. they, uh, there was a huge um, number of people that would uh, in an art colony uh, on the Hudson River, the Hudson River School, and that kind of that was not totally plain air, but it, it, that was the start of it. But the people would go out and from New York, and they would, instead of going out to Funnel Blue, they would go up the Hudson River, and they would paint. Hmm, cool. You know, I like this. I want to go out and paint outside. I don't know what I'm it's doing. Actually, it's fun if you if you understand, you know, um, that you you don't go when there's a slight breeze or windy, and that you you take what you need with you, and that people... If you go in a place where there's people, they will start bugging you and asking questions and standing around. And as Victoria said, you know, some people like that, some people don't. Mm-hmm. But And they yeah. do criticize your painting because artists <laughs> put things where they want them. And, uh, and people are like, no, they're, they, they think more photographically. If the mountain's over here and yeah. that tree's right there, how dare you move the tree? Right. Where the artist is looking for composition and whatever, you know. Oh, yeah. but then are you going to change nature's composition? Sometimes. See? Oh, yeah, like, just absolutely. Like you do. Yeah. <laughs> you do, you do, yes. yeah. You do. If you want like an interesting you. painting, if you want an yeah. interesting painting, you, you've got to make adjustments, even if it's plain air, because you just mm, exactly. you, your placement, it just all makes the, make the big difference. Sometimes you, you're in front of a, a scene, uh, and, uh, and this, you know, to, to some people you say, oh, this is really beautiful, but then when you start trying to put it in in a rectangle on a on mm. a piece of paper or on a on a canvas you have to you have to make a little adjustments because um yeah. it otherwise it won't work from a composition and that's why standpoint people who are real photographers do the same thing by moving their body position yeah like you know Lisa you've been told get down on the ground you're going to photograph that get down 
I know. You know, <laughs> you can't just stand at the same and level. And it's, and you can't just and you can't you I mean you've got to get down and you if you're a photographer, to, be prepared to play in the mud. You have to get up, you got to get down, you got to move to yep. the side. Maybe you wait for the right set of lighting conditions. And you get to have bugs really and crawl you on you while you're doing it. That's right. You can't move. So if, if you're trying to be a photographer, now if you're trying to be like a news photographer, that's get it while you can no matter how. But if you're yeah. an artistic ph- photographer, you, then you're going to play with filters and you're going to move your yeah. body position and you're going to know your subject. And then, if, and then if you're not satisfied, you go back and play with it on the computer. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. And that's good fun. And and this takes hours, you know, but uh, the photographers I know, like, you know, who've been on our shows, too, they go back to their place and they investigate and investigate and investigate and keep photographing until they get that light right. Because it's now an art. And, yeah, it's an art. And, you know, we do, like, I, I wouldn't put myself as, like, a photographer, photographer, like, you know, like Otis and who's been on our show and stuff, those, those guys who go out there and, you know, do the big, you know, I can't even tell you what this button does, but I do it. And, you know, I do photograph and I do a lot of film work. And I don't tell you this, the filming, seriously, because it's not like you could, you know, you can stand back on your tripod and go click, it's done. You are standing with this thing, <laughs> and you can have a snake cross over your feet, and bugs <laughs> come climb on you, and you can't move. If you're trying to get, like, this bird, it, you finally found the bird, and it's like, that's yep. it. And even for photographers, filmmakers, anybody, it's like, it doesn't matter what's going to bite you. you got to keep going. <laughs> this is like plain air. I think it's so interesting, the two formats, because they do complement each other, and there's challenges with both, yes, and right. how they swap roles through the years and mm-hmm. how technology changes. And the fact is technology helps people get out there and do it. So it's it kind of interesting, isn't it, how it, how it, uh, yeah. how it, it is. plays and that you role. Know, you're talk- you were talking about photography, and, and we were talking about composition earlier. And there are so many times where uh, photography, people are, you know, artists artists are afraid of, I shouldn't say artists because photographers could be artists too, but but painters are afraid mm-hmm. of photography. And then uh, time passes and they, they start um, adapting some of the things that mm-hmm. photographers are doing from a compositional standpoint in, and using it in their paintings or vice yeah. versa. So it, we all learn from each other, and sometimes our our worst fears um, are really misplaced because what we are afraid of turns out to be a real help to us. Well, and hmm. I think there's an art to um, using photography that you make gen- that you turn it into a painting it takes ma- way more than one photo, and yeah. um, it takes a lot of research to. Um, go back through photos and pick the right tree and get it by the right mountain. I mean, you got to stick to the right species mm-hmm. of tree for it. Like, you don't want to put an American tree in Africa, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, because somebody will call you out on it. But, you know, you, you research everything, get everything, all your pieces together, then you paint the painting. Yeah. Right. Like, don't be painting an African elephant um, and calling it an <laughs> Indian elephant. There are two different elephants out there. Yes, there are. Yeah. Yes, there are. Yes. Well, and we do not have the, tigers in Africa. Your, yeah. <laughs> don't get your zebras <laughs> mixed up either. <laughs> no, we're all talking about ones. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. You get, you get in hot water over that. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, no, it's, it's so funny because... People are like, you know, when we go to, when we lived in Africa, I'm like, are there tigers walking down the street? We're like, no, go pick up your encyclopedia and look at, well, back in the day when we had encyclopedias, go look at that. <laughs> you know yeah. It doesn't exist. Encyclopedia, you know, what's that? I know, an encyclopedia. We had the whole set, Britannica, remember, back yeah. in the day. I love encyclopedias. They rock. They're, they're like, I would do that. If, if in the second career I'd be an encyclopedia publisher, but I'd be out of business. <laughs> Right now, because now Google <laughs> took that you over. You have to take over Wikipedia and try to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Victoria, thank you for joining us. Good conversation. It's always interesting to me, again, how art and history play this role of art tells you what's going on in the world at the time and yeah. how well, history, you know, helps art sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, that's the way it is. That's one of the things that I really like about it. And yeah. um, I love I love researching how yeah. things happen. Well, thank you for keeping us posted and educated. We we need all the education we can get. <laughs> <So> we <appreciate laughs> You're not the only ones here. 
So, awesome. Yeah, we're always that, good talking to you guys. So You too. You too. And happy December. And um, yes. everybody, again, uh, Victoria's article on totem poles is in the uh, December-January issue of Big Ben's uh, Park and Travel magazine. So you can go to nationalparktraveling.com. It's also on the website. And uh, stay tuned for her plain air painting article going up there next week as well. And, again, the most important thing is go to victoriachick.com. She's got great articles on her website. And go look at her work and also her print collection and uh, good luck trying to buy one of them because I know you like to collect them more than you like to part with them, right? <laughs> well, I do. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've got a bid on something in right now, so I'm, I'm waiting till tomorrow to find out if I've, I've uh, been successful or not. So. Wow, I like this. It's like, you know, it's like the American pickers for, yeah. for, for prints. Like, do you have to haggle? <laughs> like, do you haggle? I'm sorry, I didn't hear like, that. Did, do you have to haggle and like? Oh no, no, no! <laughs> you don't do that in um, the world. <laughs> I just, I just, I just decide what I what I'm willing to spend, and then I walk away and wait because <laughs> I don't, I don't like haggling. Yeah. Oh well, then I, I agree. So when we go to casinos, I'm going to have that in the back of my head. Walk away, Lisa. <laughs> walk away. Oh, well, Lisa, you shouldn't even <laughs> walk in. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But um, we've got a special song for Victoria because inspiration. I was going to play it before you came on, but we're going to play it because we've actually played a really cool song for you before earlier, uh, "Clouds Alive and Wild Paint" because of outdoor nature, but. This one is Inspiration. It's from Jim Stubblefield, an incredible uh, flamenco rhythm guitarist. And uh, uh, it, he he mm, plays nice. music outside in wineries and does a lot of uh, – yeah. he actually has an album that came out a few years ago, Incendio. And um, it was with a wine with a winery for a new wine. And so they created an album and wine to go with it. It's like it's awesome. So I just figured, you know, inspiration. Excellent. It's mm-hmm. nature inspiration. Oh. So here it is. It's, I will it's enjoy it. Than Thank you. The, the, the other one we did. <laughs> I'm making up for it. Here it is, everyone. Inspiration from Jim Stubblefield. Thanks so much, Victoria. Thanks, Victoria. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye.